This powerful state stretched from the Baltic to what is today the southern Ukraine, and it was with Vitatis' military support that Haji Jirai was eventually to gain control of the Crimea. Vitatis rewarded them with land stretching from Trakai, this, his capital near modern-day Vilnius, south to what is now the Polish city of Bielsystok in the west and the Belarusian capital of Minsk in the east, with freedom to practice their Islamic faith and customs. The Tatar community grew and flourished, becoming an integral, productive and honoured part of the society of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. Magnificent mosques whose vaults reached the heavens, minarets lost in the azure heavenly spheres, whose pillars, like burnished mirrors, reflect the most beautiful objects, whose cloisters and courtyards are orchards, their pavements adorned with the most sumptuous patterns. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. This is the first of two videos dedicated to the mosques of the Baltic Tatar communities uh, that live in Belarus, Poland, and Lithuania today. The late 14th century was a time of great upheaval in southern Eurasia, in the lands where the Khans of the Mongol Golden Horde had developed a remarkable urban and steppe civilization. However, in 1395, Amir Timur invaded much of the Caucasus, vanquished Khan Toktamish on the Terek River, and proceeded to ravage the Golden Horde cities of the Lower Volga. Out of this disruption of Mongol hegemony arose the opportunity for a Khanate to be established, centered in the Crimean Peninsula, but ruling large areas of the steppe to the north, from the northwest periphery of the Black Sea to the Caspian. The first Khan of the Crimean Khanate, Haji Jirai I, who lived between 1397 and 1466, however, was not born within its territories, but far to the north, in Trakai, in the Baltic region, in what was then the Grand Duchy of Lithuania, ruled by Grand Duke Vitautis, who lived between 1350 and 1430. This powerful state stretched from the Baltic to what is today the southern Ukraine, and it was with Vitatis' military support that Haji Jirai was eventually to gain control of the Crimea. In Vitatis' conflicts with his neighbours, particularly the aggressive Christian Teutonic Knights to the west, a group of Tatar warriors from southern Eurasia had joined him. In gratitude, Vitatis rewarded them with the land stretching from Trakai, this, his capital near modern-day Vilnius, south to what is now the Polish city of Bielsystok in the west and the Belarusian capital of Minsk in the east, with freedom to practice their Islamic faith and customs. This is a freedom extended to all other faiths as well, Jewish, Karait, Catholic, Protestant, and Orthodox Christian. The Tatar community grew and flourished, becoming an integral, productive and honoured part of the society of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, the political entity which succeeded the Grand Duchy and which lasted until the 18th century, until partition between Russia, Prussia and Austria. In the forested lands of this part of the Baltic region, the Sunni Lipka Tatars, Lipka is the word for Lat Latvia, established their villages and simple wooden mosques whose forms and materials replicated those of similar areas in Tatar homelands in the southeast Balkans, Thrace or Rumelia as this was known to the Ottomans, and the northern Anatolian periphery of the Black Sea. Because of the nature of the readily available materials from which it was made, this Muslim vernacular architecture shared many features with the indigenous wooden architecture of the Baltic. A manuscript of 1558, the Rizale i Tata i Le, Le was the Ottoman name for Poland, Lithuania, composed in the court environment of Sultan Suleiman I, the Magnificent, who lived between 1495 and 1566, by three Lipka Tatars undertaking the Hajj pilgrimage 
documents their perception of their modest mosque architecture, its origins, and the local particularities of their worship. I quote, For one who has had the good fortune to see the magnificent shrines of the sublime port of Istanbul, it is a sad task to describe our sanctuaries of prayer instead of those magnificent mosques whose vaults reach the heavens, minarets lost in the azure heavenly spheres, whose pillars, like burnished mirrors, reflect the most beautiful objects, whose cloisters and courtyards are orchards, their pavements adorned with the most sumptuous patterns. Before our mosques, these, our mosques are poor and lowly, built of wood, similar in form to some of the mosques of Rumelia, without minarets or emirates, although in every large city in our land, there are mosques. Azan is called in front of the mosque, and in some places, strange in this regard, one of our community walks through the streets, calling out that it is time for prayer. In these mosques, there is a special place in the form of a chamber reserved for women, which is separated from the men and where the men are not allowed to enter so as not to invade the law that prohibits men from praying with women. The creation of grander mosques is quite difficult here, for it is illegal to build new mosques without the approval of the government. The earliest depiction we have of a Baltic Tatar wooden mosque is an 1830 print illustrated here of the Machete of Lukescu, a village founded in the 16th century, which later became incorporated within Vilnius was replaced in 1867 by another mosque, which was raised to the ground in 1940. The image provides enough detail of form and of its sawn log walled construction to confirm the above statement of the relationship of Lipka Tatar mosques to those in Rumelia Thrace. It is clearly an antecedent of later surviving Baltic mosques, as we will see. While retaining their Muslim beliefs, by the 18th century, the Lipka Tatars had lost their original Kipchak language, having adopted the languages of the larger communities with which, within which they lived, although they did write Polish and Lithuanian and Arabic script. The 19th century Tatar Orientalist, Muhammad Murad al-Ramzi, described the situation thus, and I quote, it came to pass that the spiders of forgetfulness spread their webs over their customs and their tongues with the passing of the ages. Yet, despite that, they have never lost their faith in Islam, although they have no scholarly knowledge of their faith." End of quote. After five centuries, during which dozens of Muslim communities were established in the region, the period of the late 19th and first decades of the 20th century was one of considerable poverty in the area of the Baltic, compelling many of all faiths to emigrate, many to the United States of America, where Lipka Tatars were to establish the oldest surviving mosque in America, in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, in 1931. Many Muslims remained, however, in the 1920s. About 6,000 believers were recorded in 19 communities worshipping in 17 mosques in 1925. Together they established the Muslim Religious Association and the Cultural and Educational Union of Polish Tatars, which endeavoured to unite all Muslims in Poland and support social and cultural activities. In 1930, a unique mosque of masonry construction in a hybrid Ottoman Mamluk style with diamond minaret, as we illustrate here, was also built at Kaunas in Lithuania to commemorate the 500th anniversary of the death of Grand Duke Vitautis. In 